Hey, you. Yes, I'm talking to you. Subscribe to the channel right now. Lily was a beautiful young woman who lived in a small town in Japan. Her boyfriend's name was Peter, and although he didn't have much money, Lily loved him very much. She was overjoyed when her childhood sweetheart asked her to marry him. After the wedding, they moved in together and the happy couple were soon expecting a baby. Lily didn't care that Peter was poor, but as time went on, he became angry and depressed about his lack of prospects. Peter soon grew to hate his happy young wife and started an affair with a rich young woman named Sasha. He romanced her for months and eventually she fell in love with him, despite his poverty and the fact that he was already married. One day, Sasha's father came to see Peter. He told Peter what a shame it was that he was already married. The father went on to tell him all the ways he could ensure his future son-in-law's wealth and success. Peter listened intently. Peter spent a great deal of time thinking about what Sasha's father had told him. An evil plot began to form in his mind. He decided that the only way he could marry Sasha was to somehow get rid of Lily and her unborn child. He thought that the easiest way to do this was to secretly poison Lily and to make it look like she had died of natural causes. Poor Lily was totally ignorant of her husband's murderous plans. Blissfully unaware of the fate that was about to befall her, she continued to happily prepare for the birth of their baby. One evening, when Lily and Peter were sitting down to eat dinner, she noticed her husband was strangely quiet and nervous. She encouraged him to eat his dinner, but he wouldn't touch his food. He yelled at Lily and told her to stop fretting and eat her own meal. She needed to be strong for the baby, he said. Lily finally gave up trying to tempt Peter's appetite and started to eat her dinner. It wasn't long before she felt very sick. Peter watched her coldly as the poison did its work, not offering her any help or comfort. But Lily did not die right away. Her beautiful face became disfigured from the poison first. Then she slipped into unconsciousness. Peter was too much of a coward to finish off the job he started, so he put Lily's lifeless body in bed. Eventually, Lily woke from her coma remembering nothing of the poisoning. She had lost her baby, and her face was ugly and terrible, but Lily lived. Peter was desperate. He played the part of the concerned husband, but he was looking for any way possible to rid himself of his wife. One evening, he took Lily for a long walk. They made their way to a cliff, and Peter looked around to see if anyone was nearby. No one was in sight. Peter pushed Lily off the ledge. Her broken body was recovered, and Peter gave her the best funeral he could afford, spending all of his money in a great show of marital devotion. Of course, Peter knew his money troubles were only temporary now that Lily was gone. Thinking his worries were over, Peter planned his wedding to Sasha. The night before the marriage was to take place, Peter noticed his bedside lamp was dimming. He looked at it curiously, as it seemed to be changing. The disfigured face of Lily suddenly replaced the lamp, growing larger and larger in the room. Betrayal, it hissed. Peter grabbed a stick and swung at the face, but Lily disappeared and the lamp smashed and fell to the floor. Peter thought he heard the faint laughter of a woman from outside. Shaken, Peter convinced himself that the vision was simply the result of drinking too much alcohol earlier in the evening and he went to bed. The next day, Peter had forgotten all about the specter from the night before, and he and Sasha were wed. When he lifted her veil, however, her beautiful young face was replaced with Lily's horrible visage. Betrayal, she hissed. The horrified Peter drew his sword and swung it at the ghostly apparition, cutting Lily's head off. The severed head rolled down the aisle of the church, but when it came to a stop, it hit Sasha's face and not Lily's. He heard the faint sound of laughter again. Peter ran to his tiny house, looking for a place to hide. There was a pounding at the door, and Sasha's father demanded that he open it. But when Peter did so, Lily was standing there. Betrayal, she hissed. Once again, Peter tried to decapitate her, but when his sword finished its work, it was Sasha's father that lay dead. 
Peter ran for the cliffs, <laughs> Lily's laughter following him. He stopped at the edge and looked down, perhaps changing his mind. It didn't matter. Passersby reported seeing the woman push Peter off the cliff before she jumped after him, laughing. <laughs> I bought a new house in the small town of Winthrop. The house was cheap, but the most important part was that I needed to get away from the city. A few months ago, I had a run-in with a stalker. While I managed to get him arrested, I couldn't shake the feeling of eyes just constantly watching me. I felt like there were eyes everywhere, at home and on the street, so I decided to move out into the country to somewhere with less people, just for some peace of mind. The house itself was big and somewhat old, but otherwise very welcoming. The agent who introduced me to the house had been required to mention that a serial killer had lived here in the past, which was why the house was so cheap. However, he and later my next door neighbor Sarah both told me to pay the thought no mind. Four other owners had lived in the house since then, and all of them were very happy with it. I loved the house. Its interior furnishings were beautiful and very comfortable. The people of Winthrop were friendly, often bringing over freshly baked pastries or inviting me over for dinner. Get-togethers, they said, were the key to making sure everyone who lived in Winthrop loved it there. Yet, after a week, I stopped loving it. The feeling of someone watching returned, worse than before. I tried to ignore it, but soon I started losing sleep. Giant bags grew under my eyes, and I began yawning almost as much as I breathed. Sarah was kind enough to let me stay in her house for a few nights. It was during this time that I heard the legend of Jim Carter, the serial killer who had lived in my house. While no one knows his exact kill count, Carter, also known as the Winthrop Peacock, was a man with extremely severe case of narcissism. Legends say that he couldn't fall asleep if he didn't feel like he was being watched. He was finally arrested for putting up a scarecrow to watch him during the night, only it wasn't a scarecrow. Carter had murdered a 17-year-old girl just so her corpse could stare at him. The story gave me shivers. After I went home, I felt like there were hundreds of pairs of eyes just watching me no matter how I turned. Today, however, was the first day that I acted out. I was cooking breakfast when I felt the eyes. Instinctively, out of fear, I threw my kitchen knife, which lodged itself into the wall. As I pulled it out, I found myself staring at a pair of eyes, pickling in formaldehyde. I called the police, and they were home in no time. I showed them the pair of eyes. Their team started scraping off the wallpaper and break the first layer of the wall. It's been hours now. I've been watching the police peel away the drywall of my house. So far, they've found 142 pairs of eyes in little glass jars. The scariest thing is, each and every one was staring at me. Subscribe to the channel and enjoy more videos. <laughs>
Sophia giggled. Finally, in the lobby by the elevators, they saw blood dripping from the ceiling. Look, what a realistic arrangement. I'm sure that's tomato ketchup dripping from up there. The elevator dinged, and the doors slowly opened, which was strange because every other time they used the elevator, the doors had been quick and smooth. The light in the elevator was flickering as they stepped in, and as the doors began to close, the lights went out completely. so loud that the entire building could hear them began to ring out. At first, the guests at the party thought it was all part of the scary Halloween theme. But then, the owners of the building turned on all the lights of the building and asked everyone to return to the lobby at the reception. They made announcements on the mic and all the guests on all the floors could hear it. Everyone tried to rush towards the elevator thinking there must be an emergency. But when people tried to use the elevator, it never came. The bell would ding, but the doors wouldn't open, and they were all forced to use the stairs. Down in the lobby at the reception, the building owners explained they had not played the sounds of the screams. It came as a shock to them and hence had to pause the contest. Their staff was on a check to see where the sounds had come from. Meanwhile, they did a check of everyone who had come to the party, and they realized Jack and Sophia had not returned. Just then, the doors to the elevator opened. It was empty except for Jack's watch, one of Sophia's shoes, and a pool of blood. Jack and Sophia were never seen again, and the building owners removed the elevator button for the 13th floor. So nobody would disappear there again. My name is Gordon, and I'm 26 years old. I work in an office in the city on the weekends. I used to love to get away from all the hustle and bustle and take a trip to the countryside. Luckily, I have a cottage in a small village which is located right at the edge of the forest. How I used to love to get out of the city and spend the weekend in my little cottage. Why did I stop? Well, I'll tell you. One day after a hard week at work, I needed some rest. So I decided to get out of town. I went home, packed my bags, threw them in the trunk and drove off. When I arrived in the village, it was late in the evening and I was tired from the long drive. I went straight to bed and I fell asleep quickly. One day, in the middle of the night, I was awakened by the sound of my car alarm going off. I looked out the window, but there was nobody in sight. I found my car keys, pressed the button to shut off the alarm. When the awful noise stopped, I laid down again and tried to fall back to sleep. All of a sudden, the alarm went off again. I didn't feel like getting up, so I just grabbed my keys and pressed the button again. Everything was peaceful and quiet. Five minutes later, the alarm went off for a third time. Once or twice could have been an accident, but now I was wondering what was going on. Could someone be playing tricks on me in the middle of the night? I got up again and pressed the button to turn off the alarm, but this time I didn't lay down. I stood at the window behind the curtains and watched. After a few minutes, I saw something by the light of the moon. A shadow emerged from the bushes and slowly approached the car. I could just about make out the shape. It was something tall, skinny, and black. The figure reached out with its long, thin arms and knocked on the car. The alarm went off again and, quick as a flash, the dark figure retreated back into the bushes. At that moment, I realized what was going on and began shaking with fear. I turned off the alarm and continued to watch. The thing emerged from the bushes again and slid silently over to the gate, threw a hand through them, and removed the partition holding the gates closed. I was paralyzed with fear and I couldn't move. My mind was overcome by panicked thoughts. What was it? What did it want from me? What was it doing? never go away. A shiver ran through my body from my head down to my toes. My mouth was dry and my heart was beating fast. I was so tense I was gritting my teeth and clenching my hands into fists. I got control of myself and ran down the stairs as fast as my legs would carry me to the ground floor. I wanted to look for something I could use to protect myself. However, just as I was about to switch on the lights, I suddenly froze in my tracks. 
The dark figure was at the window. It was pressed up against the glass, staring in, looking to see whether or not there was someone home. I immediately ducked down behind the sofa and peered out. That's when I realized what all these tricks with the car were for. It was trying to lure its victim outside. I could not take my eyes off its hideous face. The skin was the color of ash and covered with wrinkles. Its eyes were small, beady, and completely black. Instead of a nose, there were two ragged holes. It didn't have any lips, just two rows of sharp, yellow teeth. Its breathing was so heavy and hoarse that it was misting up the window. I just knew it was not going to go away. After standing at the window for a few moments, I heard a rustling noise as it came to the front door. I watched as it tried to push its fingers through the gap under the door. The handle began to twitch wildly up and down, and the creature emitted a chilling sound. It was not like the human voice. It was a deep, beastly growl, like an angry dog chewing on a bone. I knew that if it hurt me, it would keep trying until it found a way to get into the house. I just crouched down behind the sofa, hiding in the shadows and desperately trying not to make a sound. Tears began involuntarily streaming down my face, no matter how much I tried to stop them. I could feel my pulse pounding in my temples and I was shaking like a leaf, just waiting for it to end. I don't know how long I cowered there. I must have passed out. When I woke up and looked at the door, the creature was gone. The door was still in place and everything seemed to secure. I have never been so relieved in all my life. I ran upstairs and looked out the window. It was light outside and there was no sign of anything wrong. Taking a chance, I grabbed my keys and without stopping to collect any of my things, I ran out towards the car. I jumped in the car, locked all the doors and drove away from the village as fast as I could. I didn't stop driving until I got back to the city. When I got back to my apartment, I turned on the radio and heard a news report. The announcer said that, in the village, the dead bodies of two girls had been discovered. Their corpses had been mutilated and dumped in a swamp. I guess the creature found what it was looking for. There were four young boys who were the best of friends. One night, they decided to drive out into the woods. There was an old cabin in the middle of the forest that was said to be haunted by a ghost. The local people sometimes visited the place to test their courage. The boys didn't believe in ghosts, and they wanted to take a picture of themselves near the cabin so they could show off to their other friends of how courageous they were. That night, the four young men set out in a car and drove up a steep and lonely mountain road towards the woods. Eventually, they reached the cabin and parked outside. According to the urban legend they had heard, if you stood at the door of the cabin and repeated a certain phrase, a ghost was supposed to appear. Together, they stood in front of the cabin door, illuminated by the car's headlights and said, Come, come out, come, come out, wherever you are, over and over again. Then they waited for about 15 minutes, but nothing happened. Just like I thought, said one boy, there's no ghost. Yeah, it's just a stupid legend, said another boy, trying not to show his fear. Come on, this is boring. Let's take a picture and go home. The boys gathered at the door of the cabin and left the camera on the bonnet of the car with the cabin just behind them. The timer ran down and it took a photo of them. Then they all climbed back into the car. However, the boy who was sitting in the driver's seat didn't turn on the ignition. The others waited a few moments in silence. Then they grew impatient. Hey, why aren't we moving? shouted a boy from the back seat. The driver didn't respond. He just sat there. Come on, man, what's wrong with you? said his friends. The boy in the driver's seat slowly turned and faced his friends. His face was pale and small droplets of sweat were rolling down his cheeks. Guys, we're friends, right? He said. His voice sounded like it was shaking. 
Of course we are. Best friends. You guys would always stick by me, right? He asked. Sure we would. Through thick and thin. If I were in some kind of trouble, you guys would never leave me. Right? He asked. No way! You can always rely on us. The young man in the driver's seat smiled weakly and mopped his brow. There were tears in his eyes. In a faint whisper, he said, Then, look at my feet. The other boys exchanged puzzled glances, and their eyes slowly moved down towards his feet. Two white hands were coming up through the floor of the car. The long, gnarled fingers were tightly gripping the ankles of the young man in the driver's seat. For a few moments, his friends stared in shock. Then suddenly, they started screaming in terror. They scrambled to open the car doors and fled as fast as their legs would carry them, leaving their friend alone in the car. The boys didn't stop running until they came out of the woods and to the bottom of the hill. Stopping to catch their breath, they looked at each other with horrified faces. After a while, they cautiously made their way back to the woods near the cabin. They stood at a distance and watched. The car was still sitting there, the headlights illuminating the cabin. But the young man in the driver's seat was gone. There were two teenage boys named Ron and Chris who both shared a keen interest in the paranormal. Whenever they met, they would always have a new scary ghost story or spooky urban legend to share with each other. One day, Chris was browsing on the internet when he came across a website that had a lot of urban legends. He read a story about a certain cliff on top of a hill that was located close to his home. The website had plenty of pictures of the cliff, the hill, and the surrounding area. As he read the legend associated with the hill, Chris knew his friend would be interested. The next time he met Ron, he told him about the haunted cliff. It was a steep hill that was very dense. For some inexplicable reason, it was known as a spot that was notorious for suicides. Every year, at least 20 or 30 people would throw themselves off this cliff and plunge to their deaths. Nobody could explain why. They said that the spot was haunted by the ghosts of all the people who had committed suicide there. When Ron went home that evening, he decided that he had to check out the cliff. He desperately wanted to see a ghost. So that very night, he set out for the mountains where the cliff was located. It took him about half an hour to get there. It was almost midnight when he arrived at the hilltop, and there was not a single person around. It was dark and deathly quiet. The atmosphere was so spooky and ominous that it sent a chill down Ron's spine. Wow, this place is creepy, he muttered to himself as he cautiously walked towards the edge of the cliff and peered down into its depths. He began thinking about all of the people who had thrown themselves down into the inky blackness. The thought of it made his hair stand on end. It was so fascinating that he felt compelled to tell his friend Chris about it. So he pulled out his cell phone to call him. However, since he was high up in the mountains, he couldn't get any signal. Looking around, Ron noticed a solitary phone booth standing nearby. He went inside, put some coins in the slot, and dialed Chris's number. Hello? Chris? Guess where I am right now, he said. I'm at the haunted cliff on the hill you told me about. The view is amazing. You've got to come up here and see it sometime. Yeah, I'd like to, replied Chris. I saw all the pictures on the website and... Wait a second. What number are you calling me from? I don't see your number on my phone. In fact, I can't see any number. Ron laughed. Oh, I couldn't get any signal on my mobile, so I'm calling from the payphone up here. His friend was confused. Payphone? There's no payphone up there. If there was one, I would have seen it in the pictures. What are you talking about? said Ron. I'm standing in the phone booth, 
right on the hilltop. Hold on, I'd better go. There's a line of people outside waiting to use the phone. I'll call you when I get back home. As soon as he said this, Chris shouted, No! Ron, don't get out of the phone booth! I know that place! I'll be right there in 30 minutes! Whatever you do, just don't move! What's wrong? asked Ron. Just promise me you'll stay where you are. Don't move an inch, okay? And don't hang up the phone. I'm coming. When his friend hung up, Ron felt a wave of fear envelop him. He stood in the phone booth and kept the phone receiver pressed to his ear. Looking over his shoulder, he saw a line of people standing outside the phone booth, silently watching him. The look in their eyes sent a shiver down his spine. Half an hour later, when Chris arrived at the top of the hill, he found his friend standing at the very edge of the cliff. He was holding his cell phone against his ear. There was no phone booth and no line of people waiting to use the phone. If he had moved an inch, he would have fallen off the edge and plunged to his death. Daniel and Jessica were happily married for five years now, and they have a beautiful three-year-old daughter, Stephanie. The memory of their first meeting is still fresh in Daniel's mind. Their relationship was a classical fairy tale that usually earned the jealousy of their close circle. Daniel had never left Jessica's side throughout their marriage. This was the first time Daniel had been separated from his wife for more than a week. As a newly promoted marketing executive, it became part of Daniel's job to entertain customers from all parts of the world. His first assignment was in Hungary, and he had to leave his wife for the first time in five years. The goodbye was long and hard, and Daniel had no heart to leave his wife and daughter. The thought of quitting his job and even volunteering to get demoted to avoid traveling a lot crossed his mind. Somehow, he convinced himself that it was just for two weeks and after that he would be reunited with his wife again. Daniel took a photograph with his wife on his Polaroid camera right before leaving and kept it in his wallet to bring it with him to Hungary. That photograph was his only company throughout his journey to Hungary. The first few days in Hungary were hard to get used to, but daily video calls and the exchange of heartwarming messages kept the day going for Daniel. Every night ended with Daniel closing his eyes while looking at the photograph he took with Jessica right before leaving. It was almost a week since their separation when things started to go wrong. The night before, Daniel had had a meeting with his client in a bar and he went unusually heavy on his drinks to impress his client. They shared such a good rapport and the deal concluded smoothly. But the quantity of drinks that Daniel had was way beyond his threshold. It was surprising to him that he made it back to his hotel room in one piece that night. And that night he didn't manage to look at his photograph before sleeping as his eyelids were too heavy. The next morning started with a bit of a hangover. He tried to brush off the headache and looked for his photograph. There was some other lady posing with him instead of his wife in the photograph. He brushed his eyes harder and looked at the photograph again without squinting. He could not believe his eyes. It wasn't Jessica in the picture. It was definitely the same photograph. He could even see his daughter running towards them in the background as she tried to squeeze in with them for the photograph. But the lady in the picture beside him definitely wasn't Jessica. He immediately picked up his phone and dialed Jessica. Honey, something is seriously wrong with me. I think I'm losing my mind, shrieked Daniel over the phone to his wife. His heart was pounding so fast that he felt as though it would just fall out of his chest. He was shivering and sweating profusely. His hand was trembling while holding his mobile phone. Calm down, Danny, what's wrong? Jessica asked. I don't know, Jesse, something is wrong with my eyes or or something could be wrong with my brain. Daniel's panic was apparent in his voice. Baby, please pull yourself together and tell me what is going on, Jessica begged. I don't know if it was something I ate last night. I think I'm hallucinating. Danny, you are making me worried. Are you all right? Jessica was starting to panic. Honey, please tell me what is going on. I'm freaking out here, Jessica yelled. The photograph that we took has changed. You're not in it anymore, Daniel revealed. What are you blabbering, Danny? I swear it was all right until yesterday. But today, something is wrong. 
some other lady is there instead of you. I know I must be sounding like a madman now. Baby, what did you have last night? You said you might have had something. I just had a couple of drinks with a client. I may have gone overboard with the drinks, but I thought I could sleep it off. I, I, I never thought I would go mad. Danny, I'm worried. Can you please just come back? Like right now. Jessica's worry came out like an order. That sounded like the exact thing Daniel should be doing right now. He put down the phone and booked the next available flight back home. Throughout his journey back, Daniel kept staring at the photograph, hoping he could gain his sanity back. But he realized the strange woman looked even older as time passed by. It was almost sunrise when Daniel arrived home. He rushed in through the front door to fall in the arms of his wife, who he assumed would be waiting for his arrival and hoping to wake up from this nightmare. Unfortunately, Jessica was in the bathroom, taking a shower. Honey, I'm home, Daniel announced. Baby, you are back. Give me a minute. I'll be out. I have made your favorite morning tea. It's on the table. Have a sip and I'll join you in a jiffy, said Jessica from the bathroom. Daniel's favorite tea was waiting for him on the table. He felt like he was home when he took the first sip. He missed it so much. He missed her so much. Daniel's heart skipped a beat when he saw Jessica walking towards him to welcome him, the same way he felt five years ago when he first saw her. His love for her has not faded one bit. There she was, looking exactly the same as she always did, as vibrant as usual. He rushed and hugged her tightly. Baby, I was worried about you. Is everything all right? Jessica whispered in Daniel's ears. Look at this, honey. Daniel immediately took out his wallet and showed Jessica the photograph. Well, I don't see anything wrong, baby. Jessica looked puzzled. Daniel was shocked to realize that Jessica was posing beside him, exactly how it was when the photograph was taken. The strange lady was gone. I swear, honey, an old lady was there in your place. I swear. Daniel could not believe his eyes. He had definitely gone crazy. It's okay, baby. Maybe you were just too tired and missed me so much. Jessica gave Daniel a comforting hug. Daniel was extremely mystified. While Jessica looked at her reflection in the mirror nearby and let out a sinister smile. There, in the mirror, was the face of the same old lady that Daniel saw in the photograph while on his business trip. She had been doing it successfully for the past five years. A two-week business trip was not going to meddle with her master plan. You want to finish your tea before taking some rest, baby? You must be done. Jessica handed Daniel her special tea.